Doing schooling differently for kids who haven't thrived in mainstream schools. Hello everyone, welcome, welcome to Signpo- Signposts for the Living with Dr Kirsten Hunter. We are here with gorgeous Libby Rosentreter. How are you? Very well, thank you. And you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for coming. Pleasure to be here. Now, Libby is someone who I've been wanting to get along for a little while now. You don't know this, but I've actually heard about you repeatedly. And my, my mind is, I must, I must meet this woman. And I contacted you and you said yes. Yes, fabulous. Yeah. Always happy to talk about this this topic absolutely so everyone um libby is the principal of a school in toowoomba which is our not so little town in um, southeast queensland here in australia um and it's a school for kids that haven't fit in mainstream schools um we were just talking about what kind of kids that encompasses can you give us a sense of that because it's it's quite broad isn't it it is quite broad so our college is good samaritan college Um, It is an ungraded secondary context and the young people that we tend to attract to the college are young people who have disengaged completely from schooling either because they have genuine school refusal or other complexities relating to disability. Uh, We also have some young people who engage with us with social anxiety, um, gender complexities, um, social and other anxiety or depressive disorders disorders that really impact their ability to access that mainstream setting with the high rigour um, mm. that's there, with the high volume of people yeah. who are there in that environment. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. Mm. And do you also have uh, kids with learning disability per se or with other sort of psychological diagnoses that impact on like developmental type things? Yes, uh, Yes, we certainly have had a number of young people um, with condition, conditions such as fetal alcohol syndrome. Yeah. Um, other uh, complex mental health Mm. um, conditions at the college before. Um, Our focus is really trying to upskill these young people and support them into a trade pathway or another pathway beyond schooling. So we do offer Year 11 and 12 QCE, um, but it's a bit of a mixed bag depending on the journey of the young person as to whether they just go to work or whether we support them into a traineeship or whether they just stay on to Year 11 and 12 and then we look at other options from there. Wow. And I love that there's such a, a broad presentation of kids. You yes. know, I, I imagine their actual experience at the school would be as much about learning about each other and, you know, can you tell me a bit about the community, how everyone gets on and everyone's approach with each other and what it's like? Yes. Yeah, so um, we always <laughs> like to say we operate like a big family. So our enrolment is 60 mm-hmm. um, young people and I have 17 staff members so at the start and the end of every day we meet meet in the kitchen we have a beautiful new purpose-built commercial kitchen which has just been such a blessing Um, and it really is like the heart of the like like the home it's the heart of our college Mm -hmm. so in the at the start of the day and at the end of the day we meet as a whole group Um, there's lots of reasons for that it's a point of connection it's to establish routines for the day it's to communicate to them if there have been any changes for whatever reason, because most of our young people like that consistency and predictability. So it's a moment to communicate those things. But it's also a teachable moment. So if something has occurred on the campus during the day, it gives us an opportunity to actually talk about that like a family would Mm. um, and then reset the sales and everyone knows it's a fresh new day the next day. Mm. Um, So we do have a transport service. So um, we collect the young people and we drop them to different drop-off points around um, town. So there's a real routine in terms of, you know, the buses come in, we, ha- we feed them. So we have breakfast together. Our hospitality students actually prepare food. Wow. Um, so w- there's a lovely vibe. Um, as staff, we're out with the young people all the time. So mm. before school, easily the first bus comes in at about 8. And so there's a good 30 minutes, 40 minutes where we can just circulate and check in with young people, have a cup of tea with them, have a chat, make sure they've had something to eat. We can find out if there's any underlying perhaps triggers or setting events for the day um, and whether they might need to access some of our other supports on site. So we have one full-time counsellor and another part-time counsellor and we also have a youth worker. So Gee, that's wonderful. Got, it is. And um, the young people are really good at reaching out for those supports. Mm. Um, we get to know all of the young people very intimately 
Um, so it's, like it's a, wonderful to be able to offer them that locally. Yeah. Uh, because as we know, um, it's it's that relationship that, that gives you, um, I guess, that space to be able to really assist someone um, with an ongoing concern or even just with a complex behaviour. If you have that really good relationship with the young person, yeah, it's, it's so much more likely that you're going to get a successful outcome. It's kind of relationship-based schooling, isn't it? It is. Yeah. So tell me about – I've got so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. So um, my understanding is that most schools, um, the kids have to fit the school. And, you know, you could argue that's because there's just so many kids or because most kids are capable of fitting in the mainstream so it works, maybe. Um, Whereas your school, it sounds like the school fits around the kids. Would you say that? Yes. um, Very important part of what we do is around the enrolment process. Mm -hmm. So during the enrolment process, we will ask a lot of questions of the young people in terms of what have been the barriers for you Mm -hmm. in mainstream what are the fair and reasonable adjustments that you're able to ask for that we can put into place that will support you? So that can be anything from um, noise-reducing headphones for busy times um, around the school or it could be fidgets, it could be um, the hockey movement stools um, Mm -hmm. because they need that um, to be able to move all the time to learn. So we talk about all of that in interview. And I've never had an unreasonable request. I did perhaps have one tricky request, which was for, for a support guinea pig. And I was oh, like, really? um, um, having animals on site is a whole level of WHS complexity yeah. we're not quite prepared for as yet. Um, I think that's the only thing I've denied, though. Yeah, well, that's amazing. And then that's just written. We have a success coaching model at the college. So each young person um, is given a success coach and we will um, match them up as best we can. So if we know a young person has really significant mental health supports, then we would match them with one of the welfare team because that's obviously the most appropriate fit. Um, So all of us have five, six young people who we success coach. We do success planning with them and you become their point of contact. So you draw in all the stakeholder supports around the young person that they Mm -hmm. need, um, identified by NDIS or just the young person's living environment themselves. We'll pull in all the supports around that young person that we need to do to ensure that they're meeting those goals that they that they set for themselves with us. Um, I mean, I'm issue. hearing from you. Your objective is to truly understand the child, yes, and to truly understand the problem, so that then you can have a a, a result, a, an approach that's very tailored and intelligent. Just so insightful. It's obviously how you how you tick. Have you always had this um, this approach, this this capacity to be so child centred? It's well, wonderful. I think, I think I expect I experienced quite a bit of frustration in my early teaching career because the first um, school that I was a teacher at was very um, black and white. Mm. Um, still had a school sergeant. It was a very fear based model. I've never heard of a school um, sergeant. Yeah, not in Toowoomba. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then my second school experience, it was much better. It was a very relational college, but I still felt. Um, that I had my own professional ethics and pedagogy that did not seem to align with that of a lot of the rest of my colleagues. Mm. So initially I started in music teaching um, and I moved into special education from there because of this inherent desire I had to want to do things differently and also because of how much I enjoyed at that college, having to think outside the square. Like my first class, you know, I had a young person with cerebral palsy. I had um, hearing impaired kids. Mm. How do you um, differentiate and make them feel included when you're doing drum kit, you know, and you only can use half of your body? Mm. Um, so I loved that. I loved planning for musicals and working out how we could have the hearing impaired kids still have a part and still have them have an interpreter for them and have wheelchair access to everything. I loved all of that. And I really loved that part. I then went into autism coaching and I, I thoroughly enjoyed all of that. But for the last five years, I've been working as a behaviour coach and that's it's... I was introduced to the positive behaviour for learning framework and that just has, that just lit a fire in me. It was, this is everything that I've ever thought or felt in terms of unconditional positive regard mm. every day for every young person. All behaviour is communication. Don't react to the behaviour, find out the reason why. Mm. You know, it's the old thing of don't worry about, you, you really need to worry about why people end up in the river. Stop just 
pulling them out on the other end. <laughs> um, so I love that that out of our college, we can be unapologetically focused um, on student wellbeing, and from there, all else flows. Mm. And you said there's a waiting list. We have yeah, nearly two hundred young people on the waiting list, and it's actually really heartbreaking um, reading some of their stories. So we have an expression of interest process. So um, they fill out a, a sort of brief document, which gives us a bit of an idea of the age of the student, the concern of this the young person. Um, and it also just gives a free place for caregivers to write, and that's the heartbreaking, that's the heartbreaking stuff that some of these young people have experienced true, true trauma um, in educational settings. Sometimes not just for short term, but for a very long period of time, where they haven't fit or the world hasn't understood them. That's right, or or they've been excluded for reasons that actually pertain to their diagnosis, mm. um, or they haven't been able to attend, so therefore they are precluded from returning because their attendance is too low. So, um, so if, well, they might have social anxiety or they might have other psychological issues and therefore they're fearful of school, they don't attend and then because of low attendance they're expelled. Yes. Is, that, is that what I'm hearing? Yes, yes. Or they, they're like asked that? to either fix that problem um, and return with support or the, they lose their placement. Mm. <clears throat> and I think that comes back to the upside-down nature of perhaps the way the schooling system is and look whenever I speak about schools I always like to talk to the fact that in all the years I've been in and out of schools I find teachers generally to be very well intentioned Absolutely. and very student focused and sometimes they can become an un unfortunate collateral damage of the system mm. itself which isn't necessarily working and I, I think that at the moment while everyone's focusing on their version of inclusion which is Every school has to be able to deal with every kid and so does every classroom. But we haven't prepared our teachers. You know, mm. most of our teachers are generalist teachers. They don't mm. they weren't given the skills or training to be able to cope with complex medical needs, complex um, learning or intellectual functioning needs or complex behavioural needs. You know, for most people who went through, myself included, it was one unit mm. of my entire postgrad education degree. Um, so I see, like, a lot of well-intentioned teachers really struggling and I think that schools set things up thinking that they're doing the right thing. So we see detention and we see responsible thinking rooms and we see reset rooms and they have m many names. But to me, if that's a 24-7 resource the school's utilising, to me that money is better invested in well-being. And, you know, engagement officers outreaching to young people who aren't attending and finding out the real reason why so that they can be re-engaged and they can have meaningful engagement in life and work and their education. Um, and same, same for the young people with challenging behaviours. I've never met a young person with challenging behaviours um, for whom there isn't a very, very detailed and complex backstory. Mm. And until you address that... Yeah. You're never going to change it, the trajectory for them. Mm. A very common pattern for me clinically is that a child's had some, you know, uh, some behavioural outburst or a pattern of behaviours or school refusal or social issues, um, not engaging in class, all of these things. And then they'll come along here and we literally sit on the floor together and nut it out and then we get to the bottom of what's actually happening and then I write to the school and say hey this is what's happening and then with that resource the school's able to address the problem and you know that's wonderful but that's what's needed as a standard approach yes yeah that's what you're doing yes and I, and I think um you know it's I think <laughs> My heart really does break. And there would be there's, there's some really strong opinions about um, schools such as mine. Like the true inclusionists feel that we're part of the problem because we're not in in just existing. Um, we're slowing down the rate at which other colleges are evolving and including young people. But I would argue, that I sit whilst I see that as being very valid. Um, in the next 20 or 30 years while we try and actually get that to work because it's not working right now. That's a lot of young people who become collateral damage to me. Can you flesh that out? I'm not following what you're saying. 
And if I'm not following it, then maybe others aren't. <laughs> what do you mean? What's that? How is the school not popular? What's the contention? Um, in, for true inclusionists, they think that we... Meaning that everyone should be in a mainstream school. Everyone should be in a mainstream, mainstream class. school. We shouldn't yeah. have special education units. Right. We shouldn't have Dissolve flexible. special ed, bring them into mainstream. Okay. Everyone. Yes. Right. Um, and that whether you're a child in out-of-home care, whether you're a child engaging in the youth justice system whether you're a person with complex medical needs or really complex psychiatric needs, they, the belief for true inclusionists is that all schools should be able to cater and meet the needs of um, those young people and that should be our priority. And whilst I don't dispute that in theory, I think we should not take away from parents and young people the right to choose the educational journey that they want for themselves. So... Um, in a previous dog where I was working with a lot of the special education schools, there are parents that deliberately choose those schools because they're highly specialised mm. and they contain highly specialised staff. Mm. Um, so I don't think we should take that choice away from people. I think we should still have a variety of models mm. um, operating. And that because then be it can tailor to a variety of children yes. and with their variety of needs. You know, yes. it's not one size fits all. That's right. Yeah. Um, and I think it would be very a very, very big ask for most high schools to be all things to all people. Mm. Um, so it, it, there has definitely been a movement in education in Australia towards inclusion, hasn't there? Yes. And previous to that, there was a move with regard to special ed over to the side and mainstream over elsewhere. Is that... Yeah? That's right. And then some schools having those support units you know, within their school environment mm. um, where young people can access as, as required that mm. support, that additional support, um, and then be in mainstream for other subjects where they may not need that same degree of... I don't understand why there would be a desire to change that model. If you can tailor it to the child and they can have the best of both worlds, I don't understand why they want to, you know, increase the inclusion and decrease the specialised support. I don't understand... I think it's about um, just it's just about equity um, for those people that um, they're thinking. I think is that you know every child has that right to be part of that the, their peer group, and peer, their peer group is diverse and their yeah, peer okay. group is complex. So that that part really sits in my head. It's just how to do it when the majority of our educators, as I said, all of whom are very well intentioned people, just are not skilled. Mm. They haven't been given the skills, they're capable, but they've not yet been given those skills to deal with that. And on top of the planning and other huge demands that teachers have, Mm. um, it's a big ask. It's skills and resources, isn't it? Because, you know, the reality is that um, you've got so many little bodies in a class to to work with and when you've got some kids that really do need that um, high level of attention, if you try to work with that, you... Well, we're just splitting the teachers in two. How do they do that? So they would obviously need a lot more support within the classroom, so resources. And um, in terms of our context, we um, always leave it. We follow the young people, and if their decision is that for year 11 and 12 they want to move back to a mainstream context, we will absolutely support that to happen. So we've had perhaps five kids over the last 12 months transition back to mainstream high schools, Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a matter of us walking with the school and the young person as they transition to set them best up mm. for success. And um, I think I think from what I'm hearing, uh, your wonderful school also illustrates that this whole concept of inclusion just doesn't work for some kids because they actually don't attend. Yes. Right? Because they can't cope, they can't manage um, those mainstream schools. So therefore they're not attending. And so giving them a school that does tailor to their needs and it is incredibly um, relationship-based, then means they can go to school. So I think it's, you know, I don't think there's an argument there. I think it's obvious. Yeah. I don't know. I really hate the one-size-fits-all or or, this is our policy and just, just, you know, force that on kids. It it irritates me a lot. (laughs) I think um, it always made sense to me, that whole idea that, you know, if kids are having trouble learning to read we teach and if they're having trouble with their maths we teach we don't make a value-laden judgment about it we do what we're designed to do which is we educate and we reteach as many times as we need to for them to build capacity mm. but somehow behavior is different mm. you know sometimes somehow there's this um 
misconception that our beha- behaviour is a choice um, and that behaviour doesn't need any explicit teaching or explicit supports. It's, you know, go and sit in a responsible thinking room for 30 minutes and mm. maybe reflect on your behaviour, but you're not going to be with the teacher that you actually had the issue with. Yeah. So you're not helping that teacher or that student and you're not helping relationship. Mm. And relationship we know is key um, to actually help supporting a young person to change their behaviours. And I agree with you completely. And and I think that the um, the premise that it's behaviour is down to choice is presuming that everyone's got the same starting point. Yes. And they don't. And skill set. Skill set, yeah. Some, some kids don't have the emotional regulation. Some kids have different psychological issues, some more to do with intellectual. It's not the same um, starting point. So how can they all have the same response to behavioural frameworks? It doesn't make sense. Mm. So let's get back to nitty-gritty. You said that the kids uh, get picked up and they get fed. Um, I hear that they uh, don't need to bring bags or school. Is that right? Yeah. You you provide the school materials? Yes, everything is completely set up to be anxiety and neurodiverse proof so um yes we pick them up and drop them off i've i've found that that is has been a very helpful tool for kids with separation anxiety um even with my own two boys on the spectrum when they've gone through stages of school refusal i've found that them leaving me at the car Mm. is completely different than me walking them to the door and leaving them it's somehow different um so for our young people knowing i go to the bus stop at this time with this group of young people I get on the bus and I go to school and there's not confusion either about, and I think I have observed this um, within the neurodiverse population, sometimes there can be that blurred line um, at school um, and certainly I had a young boy that myself that went to AIOU and I, often, I questioned them from day one about this. The teacher, once they went into the classroom space, the parents were not allowed to enter. So it was very clear in the teaching, teaching space the problem-solving adult is the teacher Mm -hmm. and outside of the classroom, the problem-solving person is the parent. parent. Mm -hmm. So I think in a way for the routine that we have set up, it's just been my observation that the young ones in particular who've had pure school, like legitimate um, school refusal, have found it much easier to hop on the bus and come, Mm -hmm. jump on the bus and go home um, without a caregiver on campus. They've found it much easier yeah. to um, nope. to settle in. And sometimes that can be really tough for some of our parents because it becomes, um, you know, initially the young people do like to get dropped to the college and picked up. And I'm like, you just need to realise that you need to drop and go and trust us, you know, mm. to support mm. this young person. You'll get a text within 30 minutes so that you can get an update. Yeah. Um, but just let us do what we do and let them... Mm. Um, learn to trust the environment and parents letting go of that kind of that role of needing to be the support role the supportive role or the, any parent anxiety yeah that's going to be a tough and tough it certainly thing. is when some of them have had the experience that, that they've had um, with education prior to coming to us mm. like we have a lot of um, trust building mm. to do um, because that's not necessarily always been their experience mm. of the mainstream setting and why is there? Um, I love, I love your, I love your out of the box concept. You're saying, okay, what do we need? We're going to do that, as opposed to what's always been the traditional approach. So, why is food provided? Why um, do you have the the schooling materials provided? Um, we pro- we provide the food for a number of reasons. Um, the obvious one, um, good nutrition. Uh, the less obvious ones. Um, capacity building in terms of social communication Mm -hmm. so being able to line up being able to request what you want that's really challenging for some of our young people yeah um and you know just saying please and thank you Mm -hmm. and then we have we have and always have had a strict no mobile phone policy so they're all handed in at the start of the day and handed back at the end of the day Uh, much like the food when we have lunch and you see all of our young people sitting around the picnic tables and they are engaging and they're talking and they're skill building. Mm. And we have staff members scattered all around so that if there is some sort of a, um, an issue that needs a little bit of support, they can just dive in sideways and just provide a little bit of support to help the young people in their interactions. So I see that there's so many benefits to it. It's um, mm. being with other people. You know, 
sharing a, a meal together, like being part of something. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of our young ones would never have sat necessarily at a family table and had a meal. So this is a time for them to check in um, and also build to build those social communication skills. Um, likewise with their, um, and obviously there are some young people we have on quite um, like eating plans because they have either um, eating disorders or uh, uh, aversions relating mm. to that restricted diet and stuff like that. So it's a way for us to really encourage them there um, to try something different, you know, yeah. to try something a little bit out of the box, um, you know, where we can. And sometimes it's easier to do that if mm. you've got a peer group who's actually cheering you on to try yeah. something different. You know? Definitely. Our kids are very great, really great like that. Um, with their equipment, so we are a one-to-one laptop school and we provide that. We also provide stationery, but everything stays at school. Mm. So every everything has a routine and everything has a process. Um, so the laptops always go back on the charges at the end of the day, so they're ready charge the next day. And each young person has their own uh, stationery tray, which mm-hmm. is labelled, and everything stays there. So there's, you know, a lot of young people, um, when I read their either their one school record or whatever records that they have through the independent Catholic systems when they come to us, so many of them have missed out on lesson time because they've forgotten a pen or their laptop's not charged um, or they've got the wrong book or they turned up late because they got lost or they thought they had another class when in actual fact they had that class. Because mm, they don't have that organisational capacity. It's executive functioning, isn't yeah, it? You know? Yeah. And that's, to me, all of that relates to their disability and should be supported and mm. not punished. Yeah. Um, So we have those systems set up and it's one of the questions we ask them at interview is how do you go with keeping a track of your stuff? (laughs) I mean, we're they're they're teenagers too, so obviously teenagers can struggle with that at the best of times, but we have lots of things in place just to ensure that they can keep track of their things. As they get older, we're finding that they are bringing in a bag because they'll take work home to do with them to do at home, um, which is great and very appropriate. Um, So they sort of start bringing their bags in a bit more then, but that's good. That's just part of the getting ready for work, isn't it, and getting ready for post-school. So you don't give actual homework? I don't believe in homework. Oh, there's a Um, sentence. I don't believe in homework. um, And now our day finishes at 1.50. So the the thinking is, um, and again, we discussed this this at enrolment, like we would encourage you to get involved in some community activities, um, to join a sporting team, you know, to develop your own interests and your islands of competence so mm. you know get out and try an art workshop or, or get your part-time job and you know you're free can, you can do a two to six o'clock shift yeah um so i think i think it's really important that you know we can do the nuts and bolts of the curriculum at school support certainly some of the older one uh, young people who are doing certificate courses mm. they will definitely take some work home with them but they see the value to that because that's their career goal. Mm. Um, and I guess with that maturity, they can do that. But I believe that they need to enjoy all the other things that life has to offer after the school day finishes, you know. And, and, and a lot of our young people do work, which is great. Yeah, and, and you said earlier that, you know, your focus is on well-being. So well-being, of course, is going to be looking at that well-rounded life experience and, yeah. and also just giving them the confidence to to have its exposure, isn't it? It's yeah. extending themselves. And you said islands of competence. That's a great phrase. Yeah. So so can you explain that? Um, so we acknowledge both um, skills, personal, emotional, academic, like all, all kinds of skills. So mm. some of our kids um, have really clearly identified strengths or islands of competence. So, And they would be the avid woodworkers, you know, who can put anything together. Honestly, I had a team of teachers on building the table tennis um, table, Judy, <laughs> and they could not do it. Yeah. Um, and a couple of kids had it done within an hour the next day. There you so, go. Islands of confidence. So we're, te- we're teaching them that, yeah. you know, teachers are meant to be educators and experts, but they still didn't have the skills yeah. that they needed to actually put the table tennis together. So... Um, we acknowledge that. Um, we are a good Samaritan college, so um, our catchphrase is go and do likewise. So be, be kind and be compassionate to others in the world. So we value those skills too. Mm. There's always those beautiful young people who are the first to welcome newcomers to the college or there's always those beautiful young people who are always first to offer to serve lunch or clean up in the kitchen. So we acknowledge all of those and then, and we do talk, talk about them as being 
well, that's your area of competence. Like, that's that's your thing. And true confidence is self-awareness. When you say, okay, this is this is me and I... I understand these attributes that I have, you know, these quirks I can celebrate, these strengths that I have. And so you spending time getting to know each individual child and really seeing them and then communicating language around that, that's the sort of confidence that is just, you know, the vehicle that's going to take them through life. It's so incredibly exciting, you know. And some beautiful parents don't quite understand that they need to verbalise those those strengths. So I love, I love what you're doing. It's wild. It's wonderful. Yeah. I think it's quite entertaining, isn't it, that like within education, everything is so uniform. You know, you have a college uniform and um, often with educators, you know, they'll want um, well, if that sort of compliance and, and that uniformity. But when you get into the workforce, you realise that, that actually, or even when you get to uni, you just realise that that just isn't the mm. real world. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's some jobs where you, there's uniforms, majority not. Yes. Is that what you mean? And and still, like, you know, I think how young people think that their quirks are individual to them, like you said. But as adults, we have plenty of quirks. Oh, I mean, yeah. I think it's entertaining that without us having any word about it, everyone at my campus has a designated car park. At a designated spot in the kitchen, yeah. and it just happens. We don't talk about it; it just happens. Absolutely. Um, so I think you know, there's there's some learning in that for schools too. I think that you know, so we do like to often have that sameness. We like to know where we're going to in a classroom, yeah. where we're meant to sit. Um, it's, you we know, need to it's, know where our locker is, and yeah, I think it's sorting out all of the small small stuff so that then you can not put energy in that every day you just create these routines and then you can get on with what's more fun more interesting yes which is another reason why we don't have a school uniform yeah um so many of the young people have sensory aversions with struggling with belts um socks with seams Mm -hmm. ties yeah um the textures of you know the scratchy jumpers and things like that um same with body um, piercings and wanting to demonstrate individual individuality through their hair choices for us it's all about attending and engaging Mm. um and all of the rest of that is just background noise so i said i would much rather you come to school comfortable feeling authentically yourself Mm. so that you are better able to engage in your learning um, and your education that to me is the most important Um, and i do love that we don't have to apologize for that yeah i think it's great you're not sweating the small stuff it's quite funny i mean my husband john you just met he's from baskin spain and over there they don't have uniforms and so when we send our kids off with uniforms he's like what are we doing yes. <laughs> it's a very very kind of strange concept yes yeah i've had a lot of my asd kids who feel comfortable in the pe the sport uniforms yes. for their schools but they don't feel comfortable in the formal uniforms because the the texture is heavy you know um and it's not that soft fabric and just trying to get that support from the school for them to wear clothing that they can wear, it takes up so much energy, you know. It all comes back down to um, fair and reasonable adjustments. Like to me, if you're in a uniform that is representative of your college, then it, that's a fair and reasonable adjustment to request. Mm. Um, same with headphones, fidgets. I think all of those are fair and reasonable adjustments. Do you think we're coming, kind of in Australia, we're coming from that English model with schools, you know, where it's a, quite a lot of rigidity and structure and formality and it just sort of culturally is coming through and they're, you know, finding it hard to be a bit more adaptive to kids? I think so, perhaps. But I, I, think, it, I think it's just, again, I think schools, you know, perhaps as educators we're doing what we know yep. or what was shown to us yep. without asking questions about if there's a way to do it differently. And, um, and simply saying why. Yeah. You know, is, is this actually, is there intelligence behind this? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, so you've, uh, when you came to the school, um, you know, what was it like getting into that role? You've been at the school for how many years now? I only started at the beginning of last year. Really? So what's it been like coming in and have you, has it been a, a big learning curve for you? Has it been a, a point of kind of, been able to be a f- fresh, fresh kind of, 
you know, fresh head, fresh eyes? Like, what's what's that been like for you? What's yeah? It's been really invigorating. So invigorating. The, the last five word. years yeah. prior to there, I was working for Education Queensland as a behaviour coach, right. um, and also head of department for Denise Cable Campus, which was how, which housed the Positive Learning Centre for Toowoomba. So I had lots of kids there who were with us because they'd been excluded from other school settings. Some of them would have a share placement with a base school and then be with us for a portion of the rest of the week right. um, in order to get those more intensive supports with yep. an aim to them returning. So I had been doing that mm. and I had transitioned a number actually of our young people to Good Samaritan College. So I'd had a bit to do with them Okay. Um, in the years prior to me going there. Um, but when I went over there for a visit, um, I saw the job came up and I went over for a visit and I just... Yeah, I was just really excited about what I might be able to offer. You know, so much work had been done at the college in the previous years mm. um, to get it up to the, you know, curriculum, get that up and going. And the school was rebranded to the Good Samaritan College name from the Youth Community Learning Centre. So a big, um, a big lot of work had been done mm. to get the college to that point. Where I saw I could contribute is definitely in the positive behaviour support space. Um, in using that, utilising that framework in policy de- development systems and practices, that's that was my wheelhouse, and um, just getting things a little bit more streamlined. Um, but yes, very. I have a, just an incredible teaching staff. I was about to ask you about the staff. You They're know, just amazing. Kind of, so we've got a full time counsellor and another two day a week counsellor. We've got a careers guidance officer. She's just been fabulous in helping with work experience and. Mm transitioning people um, to work Um, and then we've got our teachers and our teacher aides so they're 17 in total Um, and they are all absolutely committed to and we're attracted to the job because of what the college is all about Mm. so they're the right people for the context I can just imagine that workplace culture between you there's a lot of hilarity (laughs) there's a lot there's a lot of hilarity Um, they at the end of each day the staff have about an hour um before knock-off time and the conversations and the debriefs and the the check-ins about young people throughout the day and stuff that's gold but then the sort of last 10 minutes of the day you know where you just find the humor in Mm. some of the hilarious things that the kids say or the hilarious things that the teachers do um yeah that's gold I'm often not in the thick of it because I'm in my office doing you know menial Mm. tasks but I do love listening to the laughter coming from uh, outside of those walls and I'm, I'm very proud of that culture that they've built amongst themselves their camaraderie and yeah, their positive outset and mindset when it comes to our kids yeah, it's great I'm, I'm hearing this culture of um, you know acceptance and inclusion and uh, and uh, I just it just it, it's so wonderful but it also breaks my heart that that's not the typical uh, approach necessarily in the broader world but I, I love that that's what you've got happening there and um and I, I do imagine that the um, career council, council would be so profoundly important because this is really preparing them to launch into their future. Yes. You know, and you f- you supporting and facilitating that profound resource. Really exciting. Can I go back a bit? When you have kids with who who haven't who are still maybe reacting to their previous trauma, yes. to where they previously haven't been able to manage things, they might have some, you know, just. Um, I don't know, defiant behaviours or just acting out behaviours, how do you manage that? You know, because I imagine you, you're, I mean, that's your area of, you know, behavioural to coaching, but how do you manage that as a school? Because I know a lot of mainstream schools are really overwhelmed. They can be quite punitive, you know, um, and that doesn't work with this population remotely. So, yeah. Well, we have to set that up right from the point of interview. Mm. And the young ones are excellent at being really candid. Um, when they come in and we will talk about their phases of escalation and what that looks like um, for them um, and what things help and what things hinder Mm -hmm. um, during that process. But um, one of the things that I did implement when I first started was having an admin building um, which was for the young people by invitation only and it sounds um, uninviting, however the point of it is that if you're dysregulated you don't need an audience Mm -hmm. Um, or if you're upset you don't need an audience. So the counsellors' rooms are in there and I've got a beautiful receptionist. The kids know. They just look through the window and they say, um, 
and I think this is all part of good learning for life as well. Mm. Um, good morning, may I please see whoever? Um, yes, I'll just check and get back to you, and then that person will go out and grab them and bring them in. So I've got a whole heap of um, girls and boys that are quite um, can have quite significant outbursts, but they know with certainty that my office um, and the council's office is always available to them. So initially it's about being all on top of it when you can see the behaviour starting to escalate, saying, dude, let's, let's go for a walk and talk. Um, mm. Let's go and sit in my office. Um, so there will be days, well, there are lots of days, when I will have a young person who will request to come in because they're dysregulated mm. um, and you just sense that strong need for co-regulation. You know, they don't want you necessarily to problem-solve anything in that moment. Mm. but you can almost feel them sucking that calmness out of your back as they sit there <laughs> and you can hear their their breathing change yeah. um, and then start to regulate and then you can have that conversation and it's always, mate, any time you tap out, uh, you're going to get a, a high five from me. Mm. Tapping out and taking yourself away when mm. you can feel yourself becoming dysregulated is a positive and proactive strategy. Um, same within the classroom, there's a, there's a tap out rule, you don't have to explain why you're leaving mm -hmm. you just can tap out for five and they've got a designated area that they can go to um and we're actually just in, in the process of setting up a sensory gym oh, so wow. there's like hammocks and bubble tubes and um, all sorts of things in there that they can access um when they're having that that tap out um which is right in the center of the school again so mm. it's it's good for supervision purposes but it's just congratulating them when they actually um, do try and use a strategy mm. you know even if it is taking off the back and doing a lap of the school that's great you know, that's <laughs> far better than you know yelling at someone unkindly or flipping yeah. a desk or what have you yeah um, but I also do find um, we have a lot of conversations with the kids about how uh, how adults can't always get it right either mm. um, and teachers are really busy and sometimes they might not listen to you at the depth or level that you need to be listened to in that moment because they are so busy with the running of the class. So if that happens, or if it just all goes pear-shaped, watch your contingency. Yeah, yeah. And the contingency always is, will come down to yeah. the office area. Yeah. I said, or the courtyard, and someone will see you within two or three minutes and they'll be out. And how comforting to have a plan and to know that need you... Need a plan. You, yeah, that you don't have to figure it out on your own on your own you can have you can reach for somebody who's going to be that support person and you know with emotional regulation I love that that's from the very beginning you're, you're getting them to identify what's happening for them to own it and, and say what can I do to to, to regulate that's oh and it's finding it's out what finding out really clearly what the triggers are because sometimes they don't know mm. um, they just react but they're not really sure of triggers and sometimes when that is explained for them it's actually really helpful and same with um but certainly we've had days when there's been a major incident on campus and if you're a kid with trauma that is going to have a ripple on effect like mm -hmm. it affects all of us when something mm -hmm. major happens on campus so we will do a really long debrief on a day such as that um, and everyone knows everyone intimately so you can talk just like you would in a family like Today was a hard day for so-and-so because of this and it's really unfortunate that it ended up as that. How can we support that young person if this situation happens again? You know, what were your observations? And we really dig into it. And I'm like, what will this young person need from us tomorrow um, when they come back probably feeling very conciliatory and maybe a little embarrassed because they've become dysregulated in front of their peer group who they actually care about? Mm -hmm. um, how can we welcome them back in and ensure that they have a soft start to the day tomorrow and... You know, they feel like everything is okay. You know, it's it's done. It's a fresh day, um, and they're really good like that because they've all experienced it. They're compassionate to it, and and them being part of the solution for their peers. What a different role, hey, to yes. them being probably experiencing themselves as the problem person consistently. Them being part of the solution that would be so empowering. It is, and I think it um, it makes them think differently to about or it changes their ability to be tolerant mm. um, it improves their ability to be tolerant and in compassionate when they understand and like I always always thought like in schools because I have very very candid conversations with young people one-on-one -on -one, um, and I often thought at schools there's so many things that we don't explicitly say 
to young people. Do it's you? like, although I remember, like, when I was younger, um, I always tell this story, mum will be rolling her eyes if she's listening. <laughs> um, but my mum yeah. was using, I was about six, and mum was using an electric knife in the kitchen and all my aunts were in there helping. It was a big family function of some description. And I heard the knife go and I heard her yell. Oh. And instead of allowing me to come in and see she was okay, they ushered us away because they were trying to protect us. But in trying to protect us, they actually made it worse because mm. my imagination is can create something far worse mm. <laughs> than any actuality. And that's always stayed with me. We need to be honest and direct and transparent with kids. Help them understand. About what's going on because... It will better their, yeah. mostly, it will better their understanding. What had happened to your mum? Oh, it was just a very small cut, but of course <laughs> I'd imagine an amputation of some she'd sort. Lost, she'd lost a digit. She was gone. <laughs> She's gone. Oh, yeah. No, that's a really good, I think, yeah. I, um, the punchline that I'm hearing is that uh, there's just a real focus on why understanding kids, getting into their head, being incredibly child, child-centred, tailoring to the individual rather than trying to get the kids to fit a mold and um and th- building their sense of of i love that phrase what was it islands of competence yes i'm going to take that <laughs> did you invent that no <laughs> <laughs> well i love it i absolutely love it well thank you so much for coming in you're very well you're it's finally here you're fi- you didn't know you've been on my mind for a long time. Oh, no, it's an honour to be here. No. I love this topic. I love these young people. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I don't know if the school can expand or if we can get other schools happening, but the 200 kids on your waiting list, they need somewhere to go, don't they? Oh, desperately. It must hurt your soul to just know that they're out there needing this sort of level of, of um, informed support. Yes. Yeah. It's yes, very, very sad stories, and I read every single one of them. Um because things can happen very quickly um, at our campus. So whilst we're full now, I can have someone end up in an apprenticeship tomorrow and I've got a spot, or I can have someone transition to work tomorrow um, and I have a spot. So I like to be very well conversant with all the young people Mm. so that you are ready and you know who you can put in behind that person. Quite a few of the ones on your waiting list have come from me. (laughs) Bless. (laughs) (laughs) Well, everyone... Thanks so much, Libby, for coming. That's just wonderful. You're welcome. Thanks really, for having really me. appreciate it. Um, if you guys want to catch me online, the website is kirstenhunterauthor.com, Facebook and Instagram, Kirsten Hunter Author, and Twitter, Kirsten Hunter AU. Thanks again, darling. You're welcome. Thank See you. Ya.